Hi, my name is Dr. Philip Wilson. I'm one of the uh, orthopedic uh, pediatric sports surgeons here at uh, Scottish Rite. Uh, we uh, want to uh, welcome you and appreciate you joining us for this online content. Uh, we're happy to uh, work with you in these educational opportunities and um, are, are here both uh, in person uh, when uh, it works out and, and online at other times. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, diagnostic and physical examination of the swollen knee. Um, uh, I don't have any disclosures that are significant to this particular topic. Uh, these are our objectives. We're going to discuss knee injury patterns in young athletes, describe the physiology presentation and evaluation of a knee effusion. We're going to review common knee injuries in young athletes so when an effusion may typically be present and we're gonna review uh, current evidence for treatment recommendations and uh, uh, the need for any specialty referral. So common pain in the uh, young athletic knee, um, for some people uh, can be a little bit of a daunting task. Uh, you know, the list uh, may be a, a long uh, sort of laundry list and can be confusing maybe if you uh, are not uh, uh, seeing these patients uh, all the time. And it may call back to a time period uh, during medical education when you remember some of these topics but uh, didn't feel that you got quite immersed in them. And so they can be a little bit daunting. And so uh, sometimes uh, rather than a clear picture, we just kind of have some confusion when faced with uh, um, pain uh, in a young athlete's knee. So in, in order to help uh, uh, decrease that confusion, in order to help add clarity, uh, you know, what I would recommend to you is that you really break this down uh, and, and take kind of a three-pronged approach uh, to both your history and physical examination. And, and what I would recommend is that you break down the history into an acute versus a chronic presentation. And that really helps sort of initially divide our, our possible diagnoses. Um, then on physical examination or by history, uh, did they have an effusion or not? Uh, can they describe what is typical for an effusion? Do you see a classic knee effusion on your physical exam? And then both by uh, history and exam, is it a primary pain problem or is it a primary motion abnormality? And the distinction between those two, we'll talk a little bit more. But if we're able to categorize our presentation and our exam into these three categories, then it really uh, assists us uh, in breaking down uh, that long list into a more manageable list. So again, here's our very long list, sprain, contusion, stress fracture, apophysitis, patellofemoral pain or instability, ACL tear, tibial spine fracture, meniscal pathology, OCD. Um, that's not necessarily completely comprehensive, but it's, it's a fairly uh, inclusive list for the things that we normally see. So if we start out with the concept of an acute event, okay, that we had an acute event in this patient, um, that, that kind of narrows it down. It removes a few of our diagnoses and leaves us with sprain, contusion, patellofemoral injury, ligamentous injury, tibial spine, or meniscal pathology. Now, if we say we have an acute event, but this patient doesn't describe a knee effusion or you don't have a knee effusion, then our list gets narrowed fairly quickly, and that generally leads us to either a sprain or a contusion. They had an acute event, they had no knee effusion, and so then most likely we're going to narrow down onto a sprain or contusion. And then we start to characterize the location of that pain. Is it soft tissue pain following a stress exam around the knee, or is it focal palpation of the bone or soft tissue? Do they just have a localized pain to palpation and not with stress of the tissues? Um, so a ligament or a muscle injury, we, we call ligaments that are, that are injured but in continuity, we call that a sprain, and we uh, have a muscle that's not been completely torn but just stressed or strained, we call that a pulled muscle or a muscle strain. So this would give us soft tissue swelling and pain, no bony tenderness, negative x-rays, and our treatment is our typical, what we call the RICE protocol, rest, ice, compression, elevation. You'll see that RICE protocol referred to quite a bit. Some people add P for protection or protect the limb or the joint and give it a price uh, protocol. Uh, but we really uh, almost always advocate early uh, range of motion, uh, rest, ice, compression, elevation, uh, early restoration of strength. Um, if they have pain longer than three or four weeks, we certainly would be always interested in seeing those patients, but generally, if this is your most likely diagnosis, that's the plan. Now, if we have an acute event, 
but we also have the history or a physical exam finding of an effusion, meaning fluid inside the joint of the knee, then our diagnoses list becomes a little bit different. A patellofemoral instability event or uh, a ligamentous injury, a tibial spine fracture, which is an intraarticular fracture, or meniscal pathology um, could present in this manner. And then it, to, to sort of start to subcategorize those or help us drill down on those diagnoses, we're gonna characterize the motion event that occurred. So the, the athlete tells us, listen, I had an acute event. I can tell you exactly when it happened. I got an effusion or I'm gonna to explain to you how my knee swelled right afterwards. And then um, you have to prompt them or ask them specifically, um, what did you feel like happened to your knee? Sometimes a twist of the knee with a valgus or that knock knee angle that can occur and a description from the patient that their knee dislocated, what they usually mean is their kneecap dislocated, a patellofemoral dislocation, that top one there. Uh, next would be uh, the knee twisted, maybe again to kind of to that knock knee or valgus position, but they'll say my knee gave out, it shifted. They don't describe that something popped out necessarily, they'll talk about it giving out or shifting. Um, and sometimes they'll use a motion of their hands to kind of show that the knee kind of moved or pivoted. Next on the list, a tibial spine fracture, the motion event that is most classic is a hyperflexion injury. Again, uh, classically in the literature, this was a fall from a bicycle 50% of the time in tibial spine um, uh, literature or series. Now, you know, as things change over time, maybe kids are a little bit less on bicycles and they're more in organized sports, but still often a hyperflexion of the knee will, per, will sort of predate or immediately to this little tibial spine event. So a hyperflexion, a pop, and a sudden effusion may be a tibial spine injury. And then meniscal pathology, this is often a, a, a twisting injury, maybe a little bit less dramatic or specific than the other twists above, and, and, and maybe the swelling uh, in, a, in a meniscal injury is a little bit less in terms of its volume or degree than the others. So let's talk about a knee effusion, because I think some folks have a hard time recognizing that or, or sorting it out. So again, the, the, the athlete's gonna tell you they had a twist and a pop, and then they had a relatively rapid onset of swelling in the knee. The knee blew up or it kind of turned into a little softball or grapefruit and they lost the contours of the kneecap, okay? That's the way that either they'll describe it or often you need to ask those specific questions. And an effusion usually can occur sometime in the first 12 hours after this injury, oftentimes within the first 30 to 60 minutes. Now, this is a lateral knee x-ray of an effusion, and you may find it's a little hard to see that if you're not used to looking at these. Again, uh, femur is up above, the knee is facing to our uh, left on the screen here, and the kneecap is there to the left. And so there's an effusion there, it may be hard to see, but if we outline it like that, if we take the outline of that, we trace around where that effusion is, you can see the muscle layer is sitting right up here, and connects the quadriceps tendon to the patella, and then the patellar tendon is here. And so that muscle layer normally would be laying much closer to the knee, but when you have that effusion in place, let's go back and look at that. Now, when I take that line drawing away, you can see that effusion sitting below the muscle layer and above the kneecap. Again, line there and now gone. And it's easy to see that effusion once you learn to look for it. Okay, here's a physical exam finding of a knee effusion. Um, so if we look at this knee, you can tell the knee is swollen. Uh, when we look at the, his right knee compared to the left knee, you can see I'm pushing the kneecap around. Um, and you can really see that there's, a, there's kind of a very um, global swelling. Again, you can see here that the outlines of the kneecap are distorted compared to the contralateral side. You can see this concavity is missing on the right knee where you can see clearly the concavity on the left and you can see this bulge superior laterally that we don't have over here. And so the front of the kneecap, you can see the wrinkles on the skin in front of the kneecap, that's no different. So it's not a prepatellar swelling, it's not soft tissue swelling, it's fluid under the kneecap that bulges here and here. So here's another example, a little bit more of a subtle knee effusion. You can see 
that we see the contours of the patella a little bit better. But if you'll look here, as I push the fluid over one direction and then use the fingers of my left hand to push that fluid back, you can see that little fluid wave right there. You see that bulge. So again, he's got less fluid in his knee and we can move that fluid around, okay? It's like a, a little um, a balloon that's half full of fluid and we can kind of shift that fluid around. So think about a water balloon laying on the concrete and you kind of can push that fluid around inside that balloon and you can see my fingers there pushing that fluid from our left to right and you see it showing up there in the medial aspect of the knee um, after we kind of push that side flat. So that's um, kind of how to find a smaller knee effusion. So if we go back to our list of diagnoses that often have a knee effusion, again, you take the history as we discussed, you evaluate the knee effusion based on what the patient describes to you, and then also on those physical exam findings. And now we're gonna think about our specific diagnoses. So if we have a patellar uh, dislocation, Okay, they have a knee effusion, they have that instability event, they can tell you when it happened. And then on physical exam, they have what we call an apprehension sign. So that top right picture, you see me pushing with my finger and thumb, I'm pushing from medial to lateral on the patella. And as I push that over, if the patella has been dislocated, it will move slightly more than normal. There is some bone bruising that is associated with that event that had occurred, and so they have what we call apprehension. They have an apprehension sign, okay? The next thing that the that kids can have is a J sign. So if you look in this video, when I flex this knee, you can see how the kneecap jumps, okay? So the kneecap is sitting out of the groove, and as we flex the knee, then the kneecap falls back down into the groove. So when we first start to flex, it's out and then it goes back in. And you can see um, this patient is asleep at this point and is not telling me they have apprehension when I push that kneecap. But again, you can see here, this is a J sign. And, and what that means is if you think about a cartoon drawing of the track of that kneecap, it would track like an inverted J or like a hockey stick. So it starts high and, and outside, and then as you flex the knee down, it comes down into the groove. Again, that last part is pushing the kneecap from medial to lateral and showing that laxity. So there's your J sign one more time. Kneecap sits high and outside. As we flex, it pops over into the groove. And again, as I palpate the patella from medial to lateral, you can see how much laxity there is. If the patient was awake, about right here, he would get apprehensive. He would say, don't push that kneecap. Um, so again, these are accentuated because the patient's asleep and it's an accentuated example to show you kind of what you'll see in the office. So again, the, the a kneecap dislocation is something that we'd like to see in the office. We'd like to talk to the patient about their options and the natural history of that. And so for that effusion or instability event, we ask you to refer that patient. Okay, next on our list of an effusion and a sudden event or an acute event is an ACL tear. Again, we have a twist, a pop, and an effusion usually within the first hour. They describe instability or giving way of the knee. And the workhorse here is the Lachman. Dr. Lachman described an exam that we're gonna show here. There's a cartoon drawing of it there in the center. Um, so this shows the examiner stabilizing the thigh using their second hand to translate the tibia forward. This is best done with the knee at 20 to 30 degrees. You stabilize the femur and you pull the tibia forward. The ACL is not there, so the tibia will come for forward further than the contralateral side. Orthopedics were very uh, fortunate. 99.9% .9 of patients have a right and a left limb for us to examine and compare the injured exam to the uninjured side, and that helps us a lot. And we encourage you in the office to always do that to compare um, abnormal to normal. So here's a knee with an effusion. <clears throat> you can see that large soft tissue swelling with obliteration of the kneecap uh, sort of outlines. Here I'm gonna do the Lachman exam. We're stabilizing the femur. We're using our second hand to translate the tibia forward, and you can see how far that tibia comes forward, and that's accentuated compared to the normal side. So one more time, we got a patient who had a twist pop. You can see <clears throat> they've presented to the office. They still have an effusion. I'm just asking them to relax their hamstrings, 
just relax for me. This patient is awake, so we're stabilizing the femur and we're translating with the right hand under the left hand and pulling that tibia forward. That's the Lachman exam. So the tibial spine fracture um, is uh, similar to the ACL. Again, twist, pop, effusion. Often, again, hyperflexion, fall from a bike makes you suspicious of a tibial spine injury as well. Um, you're going to have that same appearance, effusion of the knee. The Lachman exam is also going to be positive with a tibial spine injury because the tibial spine is the base insertion of that ACL ligament or anterior cruciate ligament inserts onto the tibia that tibial spine or tibial eminence is another name for that bone is where that bone is pulled from instead of the ligament tearing in its center portion it avulses or pulls that piece of bone off and that's what we're looking at you can see highlighted in the orange circles there the tibial spine fracture so if you see that um, then you're very suspicious of his tibial spine fracture. Again, very similar history to the ACL. We're going to treat them similarly acutely and then refer those to us because we want to fix those tibial spine fractures operatively to stabilize that ACL and allow it to work. A meniscal tear, again, similar history, twisting injury, pop, may just feel a, a slight click in the knee or, or a clunk in the knee. And then their effusion is often smaller, okay? Sometimes kids with a discoid meniscus, that abnormal meniscus that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, they won't get an effusion at all. But if you have a tear of a more normal meniscus, it often takes more force to tear a more normal shaped meniscus, and that can lead to an effusion or swelling in the knee. So twist, joint line pain, smaller effusion, and mechanical symptoms is what we describe what that means is the patient feels like something grinds or gets stuck in their knee, okay? That cartoon drawing shows the little tears that occur in the meniscus. So if the femur's rolling over the top of that meniscus and you've got those tears, then something's moving, it's getting stuck, it's kind of binding up and patients feel that and that's what we call mechanical symptoms. So twist, pop, pain, small effusion, um, and sometimes joint line pain, sometimes loss of extension, uh, refer those to us to evaluate from meniscal injury. Okay, we're going to shift gears away from that acute injury and now talk about a chronic condition. Now, sometimes they may have an acute event on top of a chronic history. So it's very important to, you know, get that history. Now, is this the first time it ever happened? Is this an acute event? Or did you have something occur and now that's an exacerbation of what was really more a chronic condition? And so really want to drill down to that history. Um, so stress fracture, apophysitis, patellofemoral again, but in this case not a dislocation often, but patellofemoral pain. Sometimes meniscal pathology, we'll talk about that other type of meniscus, more of an abnormal shape than the classic normal meniscus and then an OCD. All of those, oftentimes the patient has more of a chronic condition, they'll have no acute event, or if they do have an acute exacerbation, it's on top of a pre-existing chronic condition. Now, so they almost never have an effusion with this list. Occasionally you may see an effusion with, a, with an OCD that's popped off and become displaced, but that's less common, okay? So for the most part, this is chronic, history of complaints, no effusion. And then they often have pain. There's not a lot of motion abnormality on this list. Sometimes if we, we take that discoid meniscus, we're going to take that off the list because sometimes they'll have catching or loss of motion. But for the most part, most of our list stays there because they're, most of these are pain without a motion problem. Okay. So if we then say, okay, we've got a chronic condition, we've got no effusion, now let's say, well, where is that pain? Where does it hurt, okay? If they've got pain that is bony pain, palpation of the bone of the proximal tibia or distal femur, then that may be a stress fracture. If they've got pain right on the bump of that tibial tubercle that we all know very well as tibial tubercle apophysitis or Osgood slaughters, or if they've got tenderness at the inferior pole of the patella, okay? then that may be apophysitis, okay, growth-related pain due to stress on that growing structure. 
patellofemoral pain. And the key to this is they can't point to their pain, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Diffuse pain surrounding the patella uh, with no acute event. And then, then finally, OCD, they also cannot localize the pain. They don't even give you the little horseshoe shape around their kneecap. They just say, this is somewhere deep. It's like a toothache in my knee. I can't really point to it. Okay, so again, this is activity-related pain, chronic pain, activity-related pain, hurts with activity, no pain at rest. Often you get a history of high levels of activity, right? Overuse. Our kids are doing a lot sometimes and they repetitively stress the same structures. Okay, this guy, really important for us to talk about this guy right here. Maybe a little bit of a larger adolescent, you know, between the ages of uh, 10 and 14 classically. Um, and um, again, maybe a little bit of a higher BMI and they've got chronic knee pain. What do we need to think about? You guessed it, you gotta remember the skiffy, okay? Kids can present with knee pain or thigh, distal thigh knee pain even though it's a hip problem, okay? So don't forget to check hip range of motion when you're evaluating chronic knee pain, particularly in the larger adolescent, 10 to 14 years old is our classic range. Um, so again, if you'll just take those hips, internally rotate them, externally rotate them. If you've got symmetric motion and the hip pain does not exacerbate the knee, I'm sorry, the hip motion does not exacerbate the knee pain, you probably don't have a skiffy, but again, always important to think about that. X-rays of the pelvis when concerned. Skiffies are urgent issues. Refer them to see us the same day whenever you come across those. Okay. On to the knee. So we got activity-related chronic knee pain. It's not the hip. Okay, so again, palpation of the distal femur, palpation of the proximal tibia, direct pain there. And you've got a history of lots and lots of repetitive activity. This is overuse, okay? Uh, this x-ray um, is a 12-year-old male who was doing three-a-day workouts before football started in the fall, okay? He was on a football club they were having two-a-days in August, and his dad was working out with him in the middle of the day between that time. So he's been sitting around all summer, um, you know, playing Fortnite and not doing much, and then it gets to football time, and now he suddenly ramped up his activity, and he gets a stress fracture. And that can happen. We see stress fractures in the tibia, in the proximal tibia, in the distal femur. So again, point tender on the bone. X-ray often shows it. If you've got a question, MRI usually because you can kind of cone down on the area sometimes a bone scan if you really don't have an idea but bone scans we don't use that much these days because you really want to use your physical exam to hone down on it if you think you've got a stress fracture you've got periosteal new bone with a history of this kind of activity please refer those okay again apophysitis most of us are pretty comfortable with this the classic is Osgood slaughters, that's often kids between the ages of 11 and 14. If you've got a little bit of a younger kid, ages 9 to 11, it may present with pain at the distal pole of the patella. The distal pole of the patellar apophysitis is called sinden larsen johansson syndrome, or SLJ. Osgood slaughters at that proximal tibia, tubercle, um, uh, again, tibial tubercle apophysitis. These are classically point tender in these locations. They're not broad areas. They're v pretty much the size of a quarter. You put your thumb there, you put your finger there. They say, yep, that's it. No effusion, no sudden event. So it's rest, quad stretching, increased flexibility, and this will get better over time. Okay, patellofemoral pain. Now this is, instead of us being able to localize it, this is kind of the opposite of the apophysitis. With apophysitis, you put your finger or thumb right on the spot, and that's your diagnostic criteria. With patellofemoral pain, this is a very diffuse kind of pain. These kids cannot localize it. You tell them, put one finger in the spot, and you end up with that drawing like you see, that red line around her kneecap. They just keep tracing this horseshoe shape around the kneecap. They will not show you one spot. They say, it's just all over the place. It's all of my kneecap. It's everywhere in the front of my knee. And a lot of times these kids will look a little bit like this young lady. They've got femoral anaversion, meaning their thighs turn inward, the knees kind of face inward. Uh, they may be a little deconditioned at times, or they just may be relatively deconditioned for the amount of activity they're doing. So dancers get this a lot. 
sort of 50 to 60 percent of dancers seem to have kneecap or patellofemoral pain. We see this in lots of other sports in guys and girls as well. Um, but again, no focal uh, tenderness, no injury. Um, again, they have kind of a poorly developed VMO. They may have a little bit of that J sign that we saw in that kid with patellofemoral uh, instability because their shape of the bone underlying the kneecap and the distal femur may have a little bit of abnormalities, but they don't have instability, they just have pain. And they'll often have pain with patellofemoral compression. In other words, you just push the kneecap downward as they're flexing, extending their knee. You push the kneecap into the thigh bone and that exacerbates their pain. All right, so this is a very, very common problem. Uh, we see it a lot in kids. The, uh, that's been studied a whole lot and the answer is physical therapy, okay? You can do lots and lots of other things. You can um, try bracing, you can try changes in shoe wear, you can do acupuncture, you can do medications, um, injections in the knee. We do not recommend any of that. What we recommend is physical therapy for strengthening, uh, lots of exercise bike, lots of thigh and hip abductor and external rotator strengthening, core strengthening, and um, these do not necessarily need to be referred unless you have other unusual signs. Okay, OCD, osteochondritis dissecans. This means that we have an idiopathic loss of normal bone architecture below the cartilage of the knee, okay? And so what happens, we don't understand, again, idiopathic, we don't understand exactly why, but we know it's a cascade, usually a loss of vascularity in that area that leads to bone necrosis. The bone loses its normal blood supply. The cartilage may lose its normal deep blood supply. And instead of developing normally, you get this loose segment of bone and cartilage. It looks like an empty hole on an x-ray, but often there is a fragment sitting there, it's just not ossified. So it's cartilage sitting there that looks like an empty hole. Um, and this just causes a deep ache within the knee. They can't localize it. There's often not an effusion. Occasionally you get a small effusion, but it's chronic, poorly localized pain within the knee. If you have that kind of a toothache within the knee, pain with activity, better with rest, x-rays, and you look for that OCD. So again, they may have a little bit of popping or effusion late in that diagnosis if that piece becomes really loose and it's moving around, but often early on, they just have activity-related pain. Again, looking for this loss of normal appearance of the bone, looks like a little kind of a bite out of the bone right there, um, and that's your diagnosis of an OCD. Um, you can look at an MRI. Um, we're happy to have these referred to us with x-rays only, and we would get advanced imaging. Obviously, we're happy to have them without x-rays if you are concerned about that diagnosis and you've ruled out these other things. MRI really helps us determine whether this is a stable or unstable lesion, meaning has that bone and cartilage become so loose that it is now moving in place or it's popped out of place because of that loss of normal architecture, the necrosis of the bone and cartilage has has led it to become loose. And so we use things like the age of diagnosis, the location of the lesion, how large it is, the status of is it loose or not to determine whether it's healed. And most of that we use on the MRI. So um, for lesions that have not become loose, the answer is forced rest from activity. Sometimes we use a brace that may take some pressure off, but it certainly helps us with compliance with reducing activity. Um, and then again, if, if it's become unstable in any way, or if we can't get this to start to heal with activity changes, then surgery is needed. So any OCD, we definitely wanna see those. Okay, now let's talk about the chronic condition where there's no effusion, but now we've got a motion abnormality. Our previous list, we had a, a chronic condition, no effusion, and it was really pain without a motion problem. So now if we add that motion abnormality, then we, our list becomes pretty narrow. Again, maybe an OCD presents with an effusion and pain and a chronic history, but most of the ones that you're gonna see do not have that history. They just have no effusion and no um, mechanical symptoms. 
If you have a chronic condition, no effusion, and the knee is popping or clunking or they, they can't straighten their knee, particularly in kids less than 14, that's often a discoid meniscus. Okay, so a discoid meniscus is pretty common. Somewhere around one to 2% of the entire population, if you go to other um, ethnicities and other geographies, you see this much higher in some Asian populations. But uh, in general, just in a mixed population, one to 2% of all kids may have a discoid meniscus in the knee. If they have that, the younger kids are, no, are diagnosed with that, the more likely it is in both knees. Uh, but a discoid meniscus basically means instead of the meniscus being shaped like that C shape or that outer soft tissue cartilage rim that goes around the round thigh bone, then you have this big sheet of tissue uh, between the thigh bone and the shin bone or a disc, okay? So a normal meniscus is like a boomerang or a C-shape. Um, an abnormal or a discoid meniscus is like a disc, like a, like a frisbee disc. It's just a big disc of tissue. Um, so they may have a pop or a snap at the joint line. They may limp. They may have an inability to fully straighten the knee. Uh, so again, this is a, a, an example of a young kid. You can see the bulge at the lateral joint line, and that joint line will pop or snap as this kid straightens and, and bends his knee. And so sometimes people think there's something loose inside the knee or the knee is kind of coming out of place, but it's really this discoid meniscus, this big piece of tissue that's popping in and out between the surfaces. This is what a young kid looks like when they can't straighten their knee. They're trying to stand straight on both legs. It looks like the left leg, the one on the right-hand side of our screen, is shorter, but that's because the knee is slightly flexed. They can't straighten it, and you see on the MRI, there's this big bulge of tissue between the thigh bone and the shin bone circled in red there. That's the discoid meniscus that's kind of keeping the knee from going straight. All right, so if we have a mechanical segment inside the knee that is too large, it's abnormally shaped and larger than normal, our treatment is we go in arthroscopically and we reshape it to try to make it more normal in shape. So discoid meniscus is usually a surgical problem if it becomes symptomatic. If kids happen to have a discoid noted on an MRI of the knee for another reason and they have no symptoms, we'll often watch that and not necessarily go straight to surgery. But a discoid meniscus that has symptoms, we need to go in and try to reshape that part of the knee and make it more normal in shape. Okay, so hopefully this idea of categorizing the presentation of a knee into whether it has an effusion or not is helpful in, in helping you sort through these diagnoses. And you know, the literature really tells us that that's a pretty reasonable approach. If you look at the recent literature um, over the last uh, five or 10 years, we really see that the presence of that effusion can really help guide us in our treatment decisions, our imaging decisions, and sort of what diagnoses are gonna present. So this was an article uh, from uh, uh, 2019 in the Journal of Knee Surgery, and they looked at 70 MRIs from an acute clinic, and what they found is if there was a moderate to large effusion that was still there two weeks after the injury, then there was a positive finding on the MRI that correlated to an injured structure in the knee, okay? So in other words, if you have a knee effusion that comes into the office, maybe not a large knee effusion, certainly a smaller and moderate size, and it's in the first two weeks, that can be secondary to a big old bone bruise around the knee that leads to some swelling. But if that knee effusion is still hanging around two weeks after the injury, that patient does deserve an MRI because they'll often have an abnormal finding. So the importance of a knee effusion that persists or hangs around is, is confirmed by this study. So here's a larger study from uh, 2018, an emergency medicine study, which basically showed almost 200 patients. Now they had a little bit older than, than our age range that we're talking about, but it did include kids below the age of 18. But basically they said, if you, if you have that x-ray, remember we looked at that x-ray that showed how to find that knee effusion on that lateral x-ray. What they found in this study was if there was a knee effusion greater than 10 millimeters in, in, in uh, largest diameter on that lateral x-ray, then 
an MRI was indicated because they looked at the MRIs that were done and if the effusion was 10 millimeters or greater, you had a positive MRI finding uh, in that patient. So again, effusion hanging around two weeks or longer, that's important. Size of the effusion is important. So a large effusion that hangs around is most important. Even in the uh, more acute setting, a really big effusion might prompt an MRI even prior to two weeks. Now here's a study um, uh, specifically in our age group that we're talking about today from some of our colleagues in Cincinnati. This was back in 2012 and what they looked at was they, they looked at patients aged 10 to 14 compared to patients aged 15 to 18. And they looked at kids that showed up with a knee effusion in those age groups. And these are the percentages of diagnoses in kids who had those criteria, a large or persistent knee effusion. So age 10 to 14, patellar dislocations, ACL tears, and isolated meniscal tears in that order. Okay, so a little over one third were patellar instability events. Um, one out of five roughly, or almost one out of four ACL events, and then the rest were meniscal tears in that younger group. In the 15 to 18 year old group, so the high school kid with a large effusion or a persistent effusion, then we kind of change our order a little bit. It's more common that that older group has an ACL tear, a, a pretty close second, patellar instability events, and then meniscal tears. So again, an effusion in a younger patient, a pre-high school age kid, more likely to be a patellar instability event, one in an older kid more likely to be an ACL event, but they're pretty close together. And again, our population, your population individually, you need to think of both of those things pretty highly. And then here, uh, again, this is in, in kids looking at a, a hemarthrosis, arthrosis, so an effusion, a bloody knee effusion, which is most of these acute knee effusions, from a really good journal, the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2014, what they looked at in over 100 patients, they said if kids were 14 and under, 70% of those with that traumatic knee hemarthrosis had a serious intraarticular injury, okay? And again, just like we saw in that last study, patellar dislocation most common. Um, and so the majority, just slightly over half of these kids had negative x-rays. So large knee effusion, normal x-ray, probably still needs an MRI, okay? So the, again, per, particularly if that knee effusion lasts over two weeks. So the literature goes along and helps us reinforce that little algorithm that we've been talking about. Knee effusion can really help guide and look for those specific diagnoses that we discussed. Okay, now just a little bit of a, a, a point about video visits. We certainly um, are, are, are moving into a, an age where uh, this is something that's much more common for all of us to do. And so how do we do a, a video visit of the knee exam? Um, you, you know, in, in this case, you, you really wanna prompt the family ahead of time to know what to expect. We, we need the, the patient to have a, a, an adult or a caregiver with them, not only for our best practice, but, uh, but also um, to help us really with the logistics of our video. Uh, we, we need somebody to be able to stand away from that patient and give us some perspective of that limb, the leg. Um, the patient needs to wear shorts so you can see the skin around the knee as well as the contralateral leg. Remember, we're, we're fortunate in orthopedics that we often compare to the contralateral side, so ask them to have shorts on so you can see both legs. Um, you wanna ask the family to go ahead and write down some questions you know, prompt them to think about some of these history things that we've been talking about, but also any additional questions that they have. We need to be in a well-lit area, um, and, and we wanna make sure that our, you know, our camera phone is, is ready and charged and all that, and these all sound pretty basic, but those of you who have done video visits know it's, it's not uh, um, uh, always that easy. Okay, so again, with our, with our knee exam, we want the, the patient to stand in front of us. We want the family member to be standing away, video both legs. We'd like to see them standing and hopefully walking. We'd like to see them walk back and forth. We'd like to see them uh, squat down, hopefully walk 10 feet or so in each direction. Um, and uh, again, then we'd like to have them lay down. We'd like to have them lay on a surface. This, uh, obviously, they probably don't have an exam table at home. They could do this on the bed, they could do it on a big kitchen counter, they could do it on a kitchen table, they can certainly do it on the floor. Um, but 
kind of this distance is very helpful if you can have the person who's videoing kind of get back so we can see both legs. <clears throat> we want to see them extended. It really helps to put a bolster under the ankles like this. That can be a towel roll or a firm pillow um, so that we can see if there's a loss of extension. In that left-hand picture, you may not be able to straighten the knee all the way, and sometimes it's subtle and you can't tell if you're just laying flat on a surface. But if you really lift up and, and allow that knee to go into hyperextension, you can see a slight difference side to side, and that would really help you. So that middle picture we really encourage. And then bending the knee, you can see this patient's right knee does not bend quite as far as the left knee. And I would tell you in that middle picture, that right knee is not quite as extended or hyperextended as the left knee. Um, and so this really helps you evaluate. I would also encourage you to ask the patients to take their shoes off. They can slide their heel much more effectively to show you flexion extension of a sore leg or knee when the, um, you know, sort of that traction of the, of the tennis shoe sole is not there. So uh, flexion extension, um, uh, hyperextension of the knee from a bolster, these are all really helpful things on a video visit of the knee. So again, just to f uh, finalize, uh, uh, I would encourage you, the literature tells us that the presence of an effusion is an important finding on a knee exam, certainly in our pediatric age group. So use that history of, is this an acute or a chronic event? Use that history, is there an effusion or not, by either history or physical exam, and then categorize this as a pain or a motion abnormality. And, and we've developed some, some things to help you. Certainly you can you know, use this screenshot to, to help yourself. We have these handouts that we can either send to you or we certainly have them in our facility if we get a chance to visit with you in person. But we think this really helps break down some of these diagnoses. We've broken them down into effusion or no effusion. And then you can see the mechanism, the history, the imaging, the treatment, and when to refer. Um, so again, we really hope that if, uh, you know, using th this presentation but in, in this technique or this algorithm of thought will really help you sort out a plan of care for these patients and maybe this individual sort of handout or um, a table uh, can help you quite a bit sort through it. So again, we really appreciate you uh, joining us and um, you know, hope to get a chance to visit with you in person at any time. Uh, certainly contact us. You can see our, our um, uh, contacts there on the bottom of the screen um, if we can ever help or uh, just to talk. Thanks.